This is lecture number eight. It's going to deal to Andrew Jackson. So I call this the Jacksonian era. Uh, Andrew Jackson is going to be running for the presidency for the first time in 1824. And this lecture is very interesting in 1824. This is probably the first time we had a real blowout, crazy election in American history. Right. Andrew Jackson had been the governor of Florida, and Andrew Jackson was very popular from the Battle of New Orleans, and most Americans knew who Andrew Jackson was. And Andrew Jackson decided that he was the man to become president in 1825 time period. Well, the election took place in 1824. Running for the presidency is going to be John Quincy Adams, Henry Clay, John Calhoun, William Crawford, and Andrew Jackson. It's going to be a very crowded field this year in 1824 as they run for the presidency. All right. They all campaigned for pretty steadily, mostly in the newspapers, sending out articles and newsletters and, and things of this, nut of this nature, their platforms and so forth. When the election takes place in early November of 1824 and the results come in, the Electoral College cannot decide who won the election. Andrew Jackson had won 20, had won 41 percent of the votes, but John Quincy has won 32 percent of the votes. The other three candidates counted for about 27 percent of the votes. So there's no real clear winner here. Even though Andrew Jackson had more popular votes, he could not win in the Electoral College. So it goes to the House of Representatives. Now, a lot of these men did not like Andrew Jackson. They didn't trust Andrew Jackson. They thought he was an, out, an outsider, a political outsider, who's gonna cause lots of problems and disrupt the American way of life. The man they wanted in here, of course, was John Quincy Adams. Well, during the time in the Senate, in the House, they trying to decide who won the election. Henry Clay told John Quincy, if you make me Secretary of State, I will give you my votes. And John Quincy said, God said, done deal. He had known Henry Clay for quite a while. The two men were pretty civil toward each other. They were not really best friends, but they were, they were civil toward each other. And so Mr. Quincy Adams made uh, Mr. Uh, Clay Secretary of State which is a good position. He had experience in Belgium, you know, with the peace treaty in 18, on the War of 1812. And so Henry Clay is a pretty good choice. Then John Calhoun told Mr. Adams, if you make me vice president, I will give you my votes. Well, these two men were also uh, not real, real big buddies. They knew each other and they socialized and they got along with each other. So it's a pretty good deal. Mr. Crawford, however, did not make an agreement with, with John Quincy Adams because Mr. Crawford had a stroke. When he had his stroke, he could not serve as president. And so he gave his votes to John Quincy Adams to keep Andrew Jackson out of the politics, out, out of the presidency. So guys, Mr. Adams was able to scrounge up enough votes in the House of Representatives to beat Andrew Jackson. And Andrew Jackson got mad about it. He says this was done but total congressional corruption and it should not be it should not be happening that I won the popular vote and I should be the new president. And he got real furious about it, guys. All right, he would not accept defeat here, guys, in 1824, but he had no choice. John Quincy had actually won the election through the, through the House of Representatives as discussed through the Constitution. Mr. Jackson was left out. Well, Jackson got mad. And he immediately started campaigning for the next election in four years. Mr. Adam, Mr. Jackson says in four years, there'll be no doubt of who will be the American president. He started campaigning. He told the American people that I am for the common person. I am for the common man. Even though he's wealthy, got a large plantation, owned slaves in Nashville, Tennessee, he tells them I'm a common man. Is he really common? No, he's not. He's just a man who's just trying to appeal to the, 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 the yeoman farmers and the poor whites who can vote. 
all right? He starts campaigning. He goes on the campaign trail. He says, you know, I have watched these Baptist ministers and I have watched these Methodist ministers on horseback going from place to place to preach the gospel. And I'm going to do the same thing they're doing. I'm going to ride my horse from place to place to place and tell the people of America how Andrew Jackson can save them politically. Why you should vote for Andrew Jackson. I'm going to sell myself as if, the, as if I'm trying to sell Christ to the, to the coming people around America. And he knew all about church revivals. He'd been to several of them. And this man said, I'm going to preach the sermon of the common person and how we shall rule America and not the wealthy class. And I'm going to also do the same thing the church does. I'm going to bring in singers who are going to sing on that platform, entertain the crowd before I come up there. I'm going to warm up the crowd. I'll have all these singers. I'll have these fiddlers. I'll have all these musicians up here playing all kinds of of spiritual music and all kinds of work songs and the whole nine yards and get them stirred up. So when I come to the podium, they're ready for a sermon about Andrew Jackson and what he can do to save America. Pretty smart. He also says these churches also provide food for the membership. After these big, huge church revivals and trying to select a minister and so forth, these churches had food available. And so Andrew Jackson brought in the barbecue. He started feeding the people here at his meetings. Apple cider shows up, liquor shows up, and people identify with Andrew Jackson because they say he is our man and there's no way around it. Well, Andrew Jackson, also this and else is pretty interesting. He's gonna to go to Southern Democrats in the Congress and he recruits them to join up with him. And anything that Mr. Adams wants to do as president, they're going to shoot it down. They're going to let Andrew Jackson get the glory from all these new programs. And Mr. Adams will have very little to show for his presidency. Adams had a hard time, guys. Not a whole lot got done in his presidency. He got more things done, Secretary of State, for James Monroe than he did as president. And it's kind of said that this man was totally stifled by Andrew Jackson and the new political environment that's arising around him. This new, this new arrival of this new political system is going to cause division across America. The American people will see themselves divided because of Andrew Jackson. Okay? And I believe that he's a culprit behind the American Civil War. He's the one who got it started. He divided the people through politics here in this time period. Either you hated Jackson or you loved Jackson. There's no other way around it here in this time period. And most Americans, most rural Americans, are the ones who loved Andrew Jackson. Okay? Well, in 1828, it's time for the new election for the president. Mr. Adams decides to run for a second term, and he goes head-to-head -head with Andrew Jackson. And this election gets really, really nasty. Andrew Jackson gets really laid upon because he married his wife while she was still married to another man. Mr. John Quincy Adams says that Rachel Jackson and Andrew Jackson were adulterers. They committed adultery. That he was single, but yet she was married to another man. Well, that's true. Rachel Jackson, name was Rachel Robars, and she divorced, she divorced Robars before she married Jackson. Several months had passed after the divorce was cleared, and Rachel thought she was cleared to, to marry Andrew with no problem. But once they were married, it came out that her divorce had not been finalized. And so they were forced to split apart for several months while all the legal materials were put in order, and then they remarried. So it's kind of so it's kind of kind of true they did commit adultery, even though she's officially divorced from her husband. Uh, it had not really had cleared the court system. Another interesting thing about Andrew Jackson is that a lot of folks said he was illiterate, that he could not read or write. That's not correct. 
after his mother died in Waxhaw, North Carolina, Andrew went to live with a, with a lawyer, and this lawyer taught him the law. Once he had learned the law, Jackson was also, was also a school teacher. He taught school. So as a school teacher, he was a lawyer. In the early 1790s, he moved to Nashville, Tennessee, an up-and-coming frontier town. And here he gets involved in politics. Jackson, in 1795, is going to put money into a national and put money into a state bank that's going to be guilty of fraud, be guilty of all kinds of embezzlement and all kinds of interesting problems here. And the national bank closed it down. So he had been involved in the banking business. All right. Andrew Jackson says, I hate that national bank. It caused me to go bankrupt. I had to go through and, re and restart and rebuild myself, become wealthy again. And so therefore, I'm going to do anything I can to destroy that national banking system. He's got a vendetta against the bank. He's got a vendetta. He had a vendetta against the British. He took care of that vendetta when he put Plankingham in, in that big old huge rum barrel and sent him back to his wife on the ship. So Jackson is going to try to get revenge for a lot of things that happened to him along the way. Okay? So guys, Andrew Jackson in Nashville, Tennessee is going to become very prevalent in banking problems. He also becomes very prevalent because the state of Tennessee will allow him to become a justice on the Tennessee Supreme Court. So Jackson is not a backward man. He's educated. He's a lawyer. Uh, in uh, around 1800, he becomes a general in the in the in the uh, in the Tennessee uh, militia that's called the Volunteers. That led him to the Creek Indian War. That led him to Florida and Seminole Wars. It allowed him to go into uh, Florida as the governor of Florida around 1821. So Jackson's a very interesting person to look at here in this time period. So the, the saying that he was illiterate was totally false. All right. Then Jackson goes back at John Quincy. John Quincy had a good friend of his that came to America from Russia. And this young man wanted some female companionship. And the president got him some. He found a woman who would go and date this Russian and take care of him on his visit here in the United States. John Quincy Adams, according to Andrew Jackson, is nothing more than a pimp. He accuses Mr. Adams as being a pimp to provide a prostitute for this Russian official. That part is true. That did take place. So this got real down and dirty here. Jackson said, Adam's a man of privilege, and Adam is too wealthy to be president. Well, Jackson is wealthy, too. He's got a big, huge plantation outside of Nashville, Tennessee. He's got several hundred slaves on his plantation. And to go and call John Quincy Adams privilege and an elite, that's kind of that's crazy. Well, because Andrew Jackson politics, the whole four years of, of Adams' administration, Jackson won the election. He won my landslide. People turn out of a woodwork to vote for Andrew Jackson. He's our man. He's going to save America. Andrew Jackson had no respect for any of the work the founding father presidents had done up until his presidency. Jackson tried to reverse and tried to change the way America operated as president. He takes office on March the 4th, 1829. And America's going to have eight troublesome years with Andrew Jackson. This man is not really suitable for the presidency. First thing he told the people of America, don't call me Mr. President. Call me General. I'm General Andrew Jackson. Do not call me Mr. President. Okay? A lot of people want to kill Andrew Jackson. There's one gentleman that met him on the street there in Washington, D.C. one afternoon. And the man pulled a pistol on Andrew Jackson and put the barrel next to his heart and fired his pistol. It misfired. The man took another pistol out, put it, on, put it on, on Jackson's chest, pulled the trigger, and it misfired. 
And Andrew Jackson took his walking stick and beat the devil out of that man who tried to kill him out here on the sidewalks in Washington, in Washington D.C. Andrew Jackson loved to duel. If you have made anything that he considered to be an insult, he called you out on a duel. He had killed several men by dueling. He had several bullets in his body from dueling. He had a fresh wound just above his heart from a recent duel when he took the presidency. So Andrew Jackson's a very interesting character here in this time period. A lot of folks said he needed major medication, that the man was totally out of control. Well, he had some medicine, but he lost it. His medicine was his wife, Rachel. Rachel knew when Andrew was getting a little bit on the crazy side, and she knew how to rein him in, how to take care of her husband. And she loved him dearly, he loved her dearly. Before the, before the inauguration takes place, Rachel Jackson goes to a tailor in Nashville, Tennessee, and has several beautiful gowns made for her for the inaugural balls that took place in Washington, that took place in New York City. Before you took the presidency, you went to New York City for big balls for a week, and then you'd go down to Washington, D.C. for this wearing in ceremony. Washington, D.C. was real rural during this time period. New York City was a party place. Well, Rachel had several new gowns made for her, and on the 25th, on the 22nd day of December, December 22nd, 1848, Rachel, I mean 1828, Rachel gets word that her gowns are ready. And her and Andrew get in the buggy and they go to Nashville, Tennessee to pick up her dresses. Okay? And Andrew told her how beautiful she looked in her dresses, how proud he was toward her. Well, this political campaign and her being drugged to the mud took a toil on her. They got home that evening. They ate some supper. And around 10 o'clock in the evening, Rachel died. She had a massive heart attack and she died. And Jackson blamed his political enemies on the death of Rachel. He mainly blamed John Quincy Adams. So he has nobody to go with him to the White House. And he about decided he wasn't going to go at all. He told his friends, I'm not going up there. They don't need me up there. I'm not going up there. I'm going to become the president. I know John Quincy have it. I'm not going up there. It took his friend several weeks to finally convince him to go to the presidency. And he's there on March the 4th for the inauguration. And he gets sworn in. But he needed Rachel with him because she's the one who could calm him down during times of turmoil and, and times of very heavy reflection on what he should do as president. And she's not there. She's not there. Okay? Well, on inaugural day, March the 4th, 1829, people from all over the country came to Washington, D.C. to see the inauguration of Andrew Jackson. When the inauguration ended, they all headed back to the White House where liquor was provided, food was provided, and these people got very drunk and very disorderly. It turned into a riot. They almost tore down the White House. They broke pitchers, they broke lamps, they tore up furniture. It was totally crazy. And finally, the head chefs of the White House says, get the liquor and the food out of this building. Let's carry it all outside and try to save the White House from being destroyed by these bunch of people up here that are Andrew Jackson supporters. But just couldn't believe how these people acted up here in this time period. Andrew Jackson told the American people, to the victor goes the spoils. To the victor goes the spoils. So therefore, I am the victor, and I will be the one who decides who will serve in my administration. He fired a lot of competent people, a lot of smart people he got rid of up here and brought in his friends. He brought in, he brought in his friends and they were corruptible. And Andrew Jackson will have lots of corruption during his presidency. He also brings in the members for his cabinet. There are six members to his cabinet. He fired them all. He went through 28 people in his cabinet as president. 
make one wrong move, make one mistake, say something you shouldn't have said, and he fired them. He went through cabinet members like crazy. He just couldn't keep them. Okay? So Jackson has a real interesting problem here with people and who he brings in and the people who causes trouble here in his administration. He gets really crazy here in this time period. Then Andrew Jackson says, I don't really need a cabinet. I have all my good friends. His friends were politicians. His friends were owners of hotels and owners of various businesses. A lot of his, a lot of his friends were people who owned newspapers. And he knew that his friends could, could go and report what he wanted reported. And he accused the other newspapers of not telling the truth. They're lying to the American people. You've got to go through and, and have your friends go through and give the news that you wanted here. That's what Jackson did. He made sure that his men gave him a positive spin and that nothing was wrong with Andrew Jackson. He was, he was the best thing that ever happened to the United States, that he's here to clean up all the mess that the founding fathers had done in their presidency for the last, what, 36 years? So Jackson is a real interesting person. These people he brings in to be his advisors, his cabinet, as he called them, will be called his kitchen cabinet. These are people who come to the White House on Saturday afternoons, and they sit in the kitchen of the White House eating sandwiches and drinking beer and all this kind of stuff, and they're the ones who have Jackson with his policies, with what he wants to do as president. And he called them his kitchen cabinet. His kitchen cabinet was his friends, his advisors, mostly people in the newspapers who spun a different story than the mainstream paper spun because Jackson wanted his story to be told and everything else is fake news. Then he gets in trouble. Secretary of War for Andrew Jackson is going to be John Eaton. Old John Eaton was his old buddy from the Creek Indian War. And John Eaton is an older gentleman. He's now in his early 50s. And he marries a young girl whose name is Peggy. Peggy's father owned a tavern there in Washington, D.C. And a lot of folks said that Peggy was actually a prostitute. She's out hustling men at her father's tavern. Well, John fell in love with her and he married her. She's in her late 20s. So it says it's one of those December spring romances here. Well, these cabinet members got together for parties. They got together for various kinds of banquets and, and various kinds of social events. And whenever John Eaton showed up with Peggy, they were snubbed. The, the women of Washington, D.C., the member, the cabinet members' wives, would have nothing to do with Peggy Eaton. And one of the biggest ones who had trouble with Peggy Eaton was John Calhoun's wife. John Calhoun was a vice president for Andrew Jackson. You remember this, John Calhoun served as vice president for John Quincy, and he served as vice president for Andrew Jackson his first four years in the presidency. And Mrs. Calhoun belittled Peggy Eaton. Well, Jackson liked Peggy. He saw a lot of Peggy, a lot of Rachel in Peggy. So Peggy is kind of the substitute for his wife, Rachel. He does not touch her. There's no relationships going on here. He just wants to protect her. And as these wives belittled Peggy, Jackson got into it. He brought the drama to the table. And these wives go against Andrew Jackson. And of course, Jackson fired those husbands because their wives would not associate with Peggy Eaton. So you got a major problem here, a major drama going on here with Peggy Eaton. And it's called the Eaton Affair, the Peggy Eaton Affair, where the president sides with Peggy and he ends up replacing cabinet members because of the fussing going on between the women. It's called, also called the Battle of the Petticoats in this time period. All right. In 1830, we have the federal census. This is the fourth time we've done a federal census of the people of the United States. And this time, Andrew Jackson puts through Congress, and remember the Congress is Democrats in this time period, and Andrew Jackson puts in that he wants 
a census on all the southeastern Indians. He wants a total, complete census of the southeastern Indians in this time period. Now, there's been some trouble here in the southeast. In the 1820s, the Cherokee people formed what is called the Cherokee Nation. This nation was formed in North Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee. Their president's name was John Ross, R-O-S-S. -S. And John Ross and the Cherokees became agitated about Georgia. In Forsyth County, one of the northern counties of Atlanta, these white folks have found gold in the hills up here. This land belonged to Cherokee Indians. Georgia wants to remove the Cherokees out of this territory in order to get the gold. And all this goes to the Supreme Court. The court case is called Worcester versus Georgia. And these folks are going to sue Georgia. They're going to sue Georgia. It's gonna be a big lawsuit here. Instead of going the war path, Georgia, I mean, the Cherokees sue in federal court. John Marshall is going to hear the court case. Is the Supreme Court. And John Marshall rules that the Cherokee people are dependent but sovereign people who live here in Georgia, that their, their, their land is their land and the Georgia people have no rights to their land. You know, it'd be interesting if the Cherokees had applied for statehood. They had enough people, they had over 85,000 people who lived up here. They could apply for statehood. If the Creek Indians had applied for statehood and the Cherokees and the Choctaws and Chickasaws, there'd been no Indian removal. They would have been states and Jackson could have touched them. But they saw by suing in court, it would save them. John Marshall made his decision that they're dependent sovereign people. When the word came to Andrew Jackson of John Marshall's decision, he says, well, old John Marshall made his decision. Now let John Marshall enforce it. Let John Marshall enforce his decision. And this president is going to go to Congress and propose Indian removal of all of the Southeastern Indians. He is revengeful toward the Indians from his racist education from his mama about Native Americans. And he wants them removed. He says all this great farmland in Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee should be available to the white farmers. Well, guys, guess what? These native people were just as white as everybody else was. They were only like 8%, 10%, 12% Native American. Their DNA was already, was already being broken up because they had as much Anglican blood or more Anglican blood than they did Indian blood in their lineage. So Jackson is gonna replace one group of people for another group of people that he thinks should be more privileged than the ones who are living there. I want you guys to realize the Cherokees, the Creeks, the Choctaws, a lot of these Indian men had plantations. They had African slaves on those plantations, all right? So this is a whole interesting ball game here that Andrew Jackson proposes. A lot of congressional members are not really in favor of doing this until Andrew Jackson gets a hold of them. There's about 10 people, 10 congressional members who could shut this whole thing down pretty quickly, not have any removal. And Jackson went to them and he threatened them. He threatened them. He says, you're going to do it my way or I will ruin you politically. I will ruin you socially. And they realized how vindicted Andrew Jackson was and they voted for Indian removal. One vote, one vote in Congress is what removed the Native Americans. You know, in this time period, there's a young congressional member that came up Washington, D.C. He had lived in Kentucky and in Tennessee. He had been part of Andrew Jackson's army against the Creek Indians, and he decided to run for Congress for no other reason than to stop Andrew Jackson. His name is David Crockett. Congressional member David Crockett. And he thought that he should come up here and try to stop the agendas of Andrew Jackson. And Jackson ruined him. 
Jackson got so bad off, got so mean on him, and caused so much, so much turmoil and so much scandal that his wife left him. David Crockett lost his wife because of Andrew Jackson. He got voted out of Congress because of Andrew Jackson. The man was totally destroyed. That's why Andrew, that is why David Crockett moved to Texas to have a restart. Went to the Alamo, and there he lost his life. So Andrew Jackson tried to do what he could to destroy his political enemies. And he kept list of his political enemies. And he thought, as president, I can destroy these people one at a time. And he did a lot of people bad in this time period. Accused them of lying, not telling the truth. A lot of cabinet members left and told the truth about Andrew Jackson. White House aides talked bad about Andrew Jackson, how they handled the situation. The people who were the staff members of the White House who had served under Mr. John Quincy Adams could not believe how Andrew Jackson treated people. They just couldn't believe it. Do y'all know that John Quincy Adams decided to run for the Congress trying to stop Andrew Jackson? He's your first president who left the presidency and ran for Congress. And he tried his best to keep things on the up and up while Andrew Jackson was tearing things down. So it's interesting to look at this guy and what he's up here in this time period. Okay. A lot of folks says Andrew Jackson is nothing more than a jackass. And Jackson took pride in that. He liked being called a jackass. And so therefore he made the jackass the symbol of his political party, the Democrats, the Jacksonian Democrats. An ultra conservative group under Andrew Jackson. All right. There's no other party in those early years going against Jackson. The only party is the Democratic Party, and their symbol is the jackass. It's still it's a donkey today. Okay. So Andrew Jackson is going to push through single handedly Indian removal. I said a while ago, one vote allowed it to happen. When they voted for Indian removal, they also decided to let the United States Army handle the transport of these people out of the country. Yes, they sent in the army to displace these people. One of your soldiers from West Point Academy that's part of this Indian removal group was a gentleman whose name was Zachary Taylor. Zachary Taylor's from Louisiana went to West Point Academy, and here's a younger man. He's a part of the Indian removal. Zachary Taylor will make his name in the Spanish and the Mexican War in the 1840s. In 1849, he's your new president. The future president was involved in Indian removal during this time period. He was ordered it by, for it through the Army, through Congress. And then Congress is going to set, they're going to put out bids for different people to be on the, on the route of injury removal, to provide food and camping equipment for the people being moved. Sounds like FEMA. Every 20 miles along the Trail of Tears, every 20 miles along the route going to Oklahoma from the southeast would be these vendors. They provide food, water, clothing, bedding, housing for the people on the march. And they hired several hundred of these vendors to do all this stuff. But here's the problem. They paid them up front. They paid the people up front. And so therefore, they didn't show up. They didn't show up. These Indian folks might go as long as five days with no food available to them because of the people not showing up who are the vendors. They took the money and they ran with it. They embezzled it, in other words. Okay? Zachary Taylor talks a lot about how they would go out trying to hunt some deer and try to get some game up to make soup and make stew to feed these people. The soldiers tried to feed them because they had no other choice but to try to feed them on this march across the country because these vendors did not show up. One of my historical buddies is fed at Purdue. 
Beta was a teacher at the University of North Carolina in Char in, uh, in uh, Chapel Hill. Beta had also taught it at the at, over in Kentucky. Well-known historian who looked at Indian affairs. I met her in Pensacola at one of our big conventions, his historical conventions. I was going to school at the University of West Florida. Her and I spent several hours talking about the Creek Indians and the Creek Indian War and all this stuff here in Alabama. She was a very interesting lady to talk to. Fada wrote a book about Indian removal and she used diaries. She had diaries of Indian women and diaries of white women in Forsyth County, Georgia. The sheriff of Forsyth County is going to receive a large farm that was owned by an Indian family. The Indian family has been removed to Oklahoma. This is December of 1836. All right, guys, this white lady, the sheriff's wife, rode in there on a buggy as the Indian troops, I mean, I'm sorry, as, as the federal troops came in to round up these Indian people. And in her diary, she wrote, I can't understand these heathens. They're not human. They do not have a soul. And here they are crying and screaming because they're losing their property. The little kids cannot take their puppies or their kittens with them, and they're crying. All the cows and all the hogs and all the farm animals and all the farm equipment, including the house, is going to be mine. My husband and I will own all this property. All they will have for themselves is a suitcase of their belongings, one suitcase per family. And she watched them drag these Indian folks out of this house. And all these kids crying, the mama crying, the dead mad as hell, being pulled out here because they were not seen as being suitable to own the land. That somebody else was better than they were who could own the land. But guys, these were farms. They looked just like the white farms. There's no difference here. And they took these folks by gunpoint off their property and march them to a holding area. They put a holding area up here around Chattanooga, Tennessee. They had over 16,000 people housed in December of 1836 in these holding pens in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It looks like the African slave trade. And in this encampment of all these Native Americans, smallpox breaks out. And you have several thousand people who die from smallpox being held here in these internment camps. And here in early January of 1837, they started marching these folks toward Oklahoma. You don't take people across the country in cold weather. That's inhumane. And then I'd have the suppliers show up with the, with the tents and the food. That's just totally inhumane. Thayla wrote about how an Indian family, they had five little girls, started at age eight, down to a baby, and they were forced to march. They came to a place over here in Western Tennessee and the suppliers didn't show up. There's no food. And in the middle of the night, a thunderstorm comes in here. And this Indian mama puts those five little girls under a cedar tree. Cedar trees don't usually have water drip through them. They kind of let the water roll off of them. You can be kind of pretty, you'd be pretty dry under a cedar tree during the storm. But in the middle of the night, lightning came in, hit a limb on an oak tree over, over above this cedar tree, and that limb fell on those little girls and he killed them. All five little girls died. And this mama and her husband had about 10 minutes to bury these little girls and move on. Why do you think that Native Americans do not use $20 bills? Who is on your $20 bills, guys? And they will not use them because they see Andrew Jackson being the devil. 16,000 people left Tennessee, Cherokees, heading Oklahoma. 
And when they arrived in the spring of 1837, only 10,000 had survived. They genocide 6,000 people here on the Trail of Tears. Where do you think Adolf Hitler got the idea of removing people that he did not like and doing away with them? He learned it from the Americans. He learned from our history. He told, he told the Berlin press, he says, you know, the Americans had a, sub, had a subhuman group that they didn't like. And they did a pretty good job getting rid of them. Took them out, they, they marched them across the country. They killed about a third of them. They put them in camps where smallpox broke out. They went to Oklahoma where smallpox broke out. And then they started Indian Affairs, the Department of Indi the Indian Bureau. And they started feeding all these Indians all kinds of dirty food, rotten food, and so forth. And they died from genocide from their diets. It's called scientific genocide. And you can genocide people from their diets. Start feeding them pork and hamburgers and French fries and onion rings is all they eat. Don't take long. It don't take long. But you'll go through scientific genocide. You've got to eat good, you've got to eat clean. And these folks didn't have it. Okay? Feeding them fried bread and stuff of this nature. All right? So Andrew Jackson is going to please his mama for what he did for Indians in the 1830s and his trail of tears, his genocide of American people. All right? Marching people across the country and not feeding them. So Andrew Jackson is well known for the problems with Indian affairs here in this time period. A lot of people says the rule for Indians is going to be destruction through genocide, removal, and reconstruction. Moving to a new location and reconstruct them, kind of trying to turn them into good Americans. And history two class, I'm gonna tell y'all how they did that or how they tried to do this. Y'all hadn't heard nothing yet about Indian affairs. And Andrew Jackson starts all of this stuff. Okay. In 1832, during the re-election, several interesting things took place. Number one, Congress raised the tariff on foreign imports to an all-time high. And the American South got mad about it. The American South bought lots of goods out of Europe. Those homes they lived in, those plantation houses, had furniture and pianos and other things that came directly from Europe. They had chinaware and pots and pans and all kinds of kitchen utensils that came out of Germany. And now the, the, the fares increased, the tariffs have increased on these imported goods. In return for the Tariff Act of 1832, Great Britain lowered the price of cotton. So now your cotton farmers in the South are making less money, but paying more money for imported goods. And they got mad about it. Your Vice President, Henry uh, uh, John Calhoun is from South Carolina. And John Calhoun got so mad about it that he left the vice presidency. He went back to South Carolina. And the people of South Carolina just started discussing seceding from the Union. The second round of secession talks is going to take place in the American South. And here South Carolina starts forming a plan to secede from the Union. Guys, the Constitution does not discuss secession. Discuss how you can enter the union, but not how to leave the union. And remember, the Constitution says whatever is not discussed in the Constitution is left up to the people and to the states to decide. So this becomes a state's rights issue. The state says it has a right to secede from the union. Well, Andrew Jackson says if you guys secede, I'm going to send federal troops in there. And the first tree I come to in North and South Carolina, I'm gonna hang John C. Calhoun from it. Threaten to murder his vice president, guys. 
John Calhoun was seriously concerned about his life during this time period. He knew that Jackson was mean enough to do it. And Jackson says, I'll send federal troops to these, to these rebellious states. I'll bring, in, I'll bring in military governors to govern these states. And I will reconstruct you. I will do the same thing to South Carolina that the British did to Massachusetts in 1776. And he meant it. Well, thank goodness cooler heads prevailed in this time period and the American Congress returned the tariff to its normal state. The tariff was returned to its normal percentage. South Carolina, decided to stay with the Union, all right? This is called the South Carolina crisis, secession crisis of this time period. The United States will back off on the tariffs. South Carolina is going to come into the fold. What Andrew Jackson proposed by sending federal troops in and, and, and military governors was called the force bill. We will force them to stay in the Union. And this was interesting, guys. Andrew Jackson has just mandated what should be done if states want to secede from the Union. You send in federal troops, you put in a, you put in a, a military governor, and you reconstruct that state. You arrest those who are causing the trouble, you run some folks off, you may even go through and hang some folks in this time, in this time period but you are going to obey what the president says here or he will punish you. Andrew Jackson just told future presidents how to handle secession. And of course, the one who should be paying attention was James Buchanan. He was president when South Carolina seceded in 1860 and then Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia and Florida right behind. What if James Buchanan had sent federal troops in South Carolina in December of 1860, put in a, put in a governor who's a military man, a general, and rebuilt South Carolina? Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, and Georgia would have thought twice about seceding. But Buchanan did not do it. He says that the states have rights, and I believe that's right to do it. That Abraham Lincoln, who caused the problem of secession, deal with him and becomes president. Here comes dirty politics, guys. It's going to get crazy. It's going to get crazier as time goes on. All right? So Mr. Jackson is going to deal with South Carolina and tell them, if you secede from the Union, I am going to reconstruct you and they backed off. Also in this election year of 1832, the National Bank comes up in the, in the big discussion. In 1832, you got Andrew Jackson going against Mr. Henry Clay for the presidency. And Andrew Jackson brings up the bank as part of the political turmoil of the time period. And Andrew Jackson tells the American people here in July of 1832, July the 4th, 1832, that the bank is unconstitutional and he will not renew the bank in 1836. The bank becomes a major political issue here, guys, in this time period. He says the bank is totally illegal. He's found a way to get back to the bank, back at the bank for his problems in the 1790s in Nashville, Tennessee. That's the only reason he did it. And then the people says, well, Andrew, if you go through and destroy the bank, we're gonna do five about our money supply. We're gonna do about our currency being distributed around the country. He says, ain't no problem. I'll have my friends who own banks become the banks that prints money and oversees the American currency. More corruption, more scandal because of this. And Jackson called these banks his pet banks, P-E-T. My pet banks will take care of the money supply in America. In 1836, they closed the banks down. Oh, Nicholas, Nicholas, Nicholas Biddle, B-I-D-D-L-E, Nicholas Biddle is in charge of the banks. And he told him, 
He says, Jackson, if you close down your banking system, you're going to put America into a financial panic. You're going to have farmers lose their farms. All your common men are going to be hit hard by your decisions. You're going to lose industries. You're going to lose railroads. You're going to lose textile mills. America will be in a mess. And Jackson didn't believe it. So Nicholas Biddle started pulling back loans, making people pay off their loans early to show Jackson what happened. Foreign nations had invested heavily into the United States. The French, the Dutch, the Germans, Switzerland, Italy, Spain, England had all put big investments into the United States during this time period. They own stock in railroad companies. They own stock in industrial plants. They own stock in, in large mercantile houses. They're involved in cotton production. And as Nicholas Biddle pulled back these accounts and, and foreclosed on these businesses, the American economy began to change, began to start falling, faltering, started falling. Because of Andrew Jackson, guys, we go into the worst depression in American history. It's going to take a war with Mexico and a gold rush out of California to get us out of this depression. It's going to be pretty bad. It's going to be pretty bad. Andrew Jackson is doing harm to the American people. And the sad, the sad part about it is these common men that he said he that supported him, he was for them. By closing that bank, he ruined them. They lost their farms. They lost their businesses. It got pretty bad. A lot of your railroads foreclosed. It's going to get really bad in America here in this time period because this man has no concern about the people. He only cares about himself and his policies. He cares only about himself and his policies. Okay. It's also during this time of 1836, the gag act comes out, out of Congress. They tell these abolitionists they cannot send materials to the South. That's against slavery. Jackson backs all of that up. He violates freedom of express, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly by doing so. People up north don't like Andrew Jackson. They say he's destroying the country. Those New Englanders want him out of there as quickly as possible. And because of Jackson's attitudes, because the way Jackson handled American, the American economy during this time period, American politics during this time period, a new political party is going to be formed. The new party is called the Whig Party, W-H-I-G, the Whig Party. The Whig Party is formed because of the, of the downfalls of Andrew Jackson. And this new Whig Party looks a lot like the old Federalist Party. The first thing the Whig Party wants to do is bring back the national banking system. To bring it back. To stabilize the American economy. Well, guys, this will not happen until 1862 when, when Abraham Lincoln and Solomon Chase the man who's head of the Treasury Department during this time period, bring back the National Bank. In 1862, they bring the bank back, and the bank is used to build the American industrial complex that is needed to win the war. James K. Polk tried to solve the problem in the late 1840s. He brought in the Department of the Treasury, and that did help some. But the National Bank is what's going to solve the problem. Okay? Andrew Jackson destroyed the bank, and good Lord, it all fell through. This Great Depression happens, and here comes the Whig Party. The Whig Party is going to be for social reform. They want to end sweatshops across the country. Most immigrant women, most poor women are involved in, in uh, sweatshop business, and these folks do not, do not even make a living wage. They're working from sun up to sundown, six days a week. Most and oftentimes their children are working with them. Child labor is a big problem during this time period. 
So the Whig Party wants to go through and change the way America hires people and how they treat workers. They want to increase the wages, make it more profitable for women to work. A lot of your workers here in this time period that work for industries, they're hollering for a profit sharing. If we're the ones who build the tools, but we're the ones who build the trade items, then we should get part of the profits because we're part of the machinery. And we should get part of the profits. And of course, these owners of industries would not have it. They would not have it. They would not give the people their due respects or their due pay from all the work they did for them. It's like Adam Smith says, you industrialize and you are going to create a degree of greed in America, a greed in the, in the workforce here in which a few people control the works of hundreds of people and the, and the upper class are the ones who control industry. They'll make more and more money off the backs of the people who work for them. Okay. The Whig Party also wants to see prison reform. They want to see mental hospitals built to help the people who are mentally ill during this time period. They want to build better orphanages for children who have no parents. They want to go through and improve the city infrastructure, build bridges, improve the roads, bring in clean water, like Flint, Michigan, for instance, bring in better sewage for the cities of America. Okay, so guys, you have this group of people who come to the Whig Party who are for social reform. They want to clean up society. They want to help the American people, all right? The Whig Party of this time period looks a lot like today's Democrats. Today's Republicans look like Jacksonian Democrats, okay? When I saw President Trump put the picture of Andrew Jackson in the Oval Office, I thought, oh, Lord, here we go. Oh, mercy me, here we go. It's going to be an interesting four years with Andrew Jackson's picture hanging in the Oval Office. I see a lot of similarities. I got a feeling, guys, in the next 10, 15, 20 years, a lot of historians will write about Jackson and Trump. And it's going to be a wild roller coaster ride when all that stuff starts appearing. And there's already been lots of books about Trump and lots of books about Obama and George W. and Bill Clinton and Ronald Reagan. It's going to get crazy in the future, guys. And it all starts here with Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson's policies begin to divide the country. Either you love him or you hate him. His haters were in the North. His lovers were in the South. Jackson leaves office on March the 4th, 1837. His vice president is going to be Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren runs the country just like Andrew Jackson did. And you do the math. You go from 1830, from 1837 to 1860. That's 37, that's 47, that's 57, that's 20 years, 23 years after Andrew Jackson leaves office we have the Civil War. That's how long it took for us to get there. 23, 24 years. That's crazy. But you have not heard nothing yet. In 1836, actually 1835, John Marshall dies. The head of the Supreme Court, the father of the Supreme Court, dies. And Andrew Jackson decides that he is going to push in his man into the Chief Justice position. The House and the Senate were all being pretty much fulfilled with Democrats. And Jackson had no trouble of putting his man into the Supreme Court as Chief Justice. He did it on election year. He did, just for the, he did just for the election to the place in 1836. Okay? The man he chose was named Roger Tanay, T-A-N-E-Y. Roger Tanay is a gentleman that finally shut down the banking system. Mr. Jackson put four men 
into office to destroy that bank. And the first three could not do it for him. Tanae did it. To reward Tanae, he named the Supreme Court Chief Justice, one of the worst Supreme Court Chief Justices in American history. Tanae was born and raised in Maryland on a, on a large slave plantation. And he does not like anything that interferes with slavery. He believes that slavery is the law of the land. I want to tell you something, guys. Supreme Court people have a long reach into the future. Janae is Supreme, so this is a Supreme Court Chief Justice until 1867. When he dies, they put Solomon Chase in as the Supreme Court Chief Justice. Roger Janae is a gentleman who said in the Dred Scott case that slavery is the law of the land. We had several chances in 1840 and 1850s to do away with slavery. And since the presidents and the Congress would not deal with it, Supreme Court does. But any kind of social issue is not dealt with by the House and the Senate and the president, it goes to the Supreme Court. That's how Obamacare comes into play. This is how gay marriage comes into play. Supreme Court decided because the other ones would not decide on it. In 1857, Tanay says that slavery is the law of the land, that slavery will never end because it's law of the land. So Andrew Jackson, as president, brings a lot of turmoil into the presidency. He says he's for the common people, but he's actually for himself. He does not care about politics. He don't care about anything but doing what he wants to be done. A lot of folks said if Rachel Jackson had to live, a lot of this stuff would never happen. She said, they said that she would have stopped in removal and reminded him of their little boy from Alabama that he stole from his dead parents. She would have reminded him of the people of the South and the importance of cotton to them and the European trade. She would have talked to him about the banking system and how important the banking the bank was to the American people. And he had nobody here to stop him. Nobody understood Andrew Jackson. A lot of historians said Andrew Jackson needed some major medication, but he wouldn't have taken it if he had it. So Andrew Jackson is a very typical person in American history. He is your first non-founding father president. He's your first non-founding father president. You're going to do it the general's way or it's not going to happen. He used the newspapers to promote himself and put down his enemies. Jackson is a very interesting person to look at. Well, guys, when he leaves office, which I'm surprised he did after eight years, I'm surprised he obeyed that rule. He was getting older. He did not feel that well. And he decided to hand it over to Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren is going to serve for four years as president. And all he does is make things worse. In 1839, the Depression doubles up on us. It's going to hit everybody. People in the city starve because they had no food. Farmers lost their farms and food production decreased across the country. It's going to be a mess here, guys, in America during the times of Martin Van Buren. That's where the Whig Party comes in trying to stabilize all of this stuff, trying to make a difference. In 1840, the Whig Party is going to run its first candidate for the presidency. And the man they chose is not any better than Andrew Jackson. He's just like him. This man slaughtered Indians just as bad as Andrew Jackson did when he went against the Shawnee in the Shawnee Wars during the War of 1812. The new man's name is William Henry Harrison, an Indian fighter. William Henry Harrison runs for the presidency. The Whig Party chose him because they thought this general, this former general, might be the man to defeat Martin Van Buren. Then they chose a gentleman to run with Mr. Harrison, and his name was John Tyler. 
John Tyler was from Virginia. He was a congressional member. John Tyler, John Tyler was a Jacksonian Democrat. And all of a sudden he changes parties. Y'all be leery of people who change political parties and run for office. They're up to something. And a lot of folks done it. I saw, I saw a lot of Southern Democrats in the 1980s that turned into Republicans so they could win elections. Y'all know in 1975, a Republican in Oakland County could not win office in Oakland County. The whole South was Democratic. Ronald Reagan changed all of this. People identify with Ronald Reagan, the moral majority, the conservative class. And so they switched parties. Democrats became the liberals. Republicans became, became, became the conservatives. In the 1950s, Republicans were seen as being extremely liberal, and the Democrats were the conservatives. People say, well, how do you feel about politics? I'm like, I'm middle of the road. I vote for the person. I don't care about no political parties. I vote for the person. And I have voted for some crazy people in my time, which I hadn't voted for, but I did. But I try to make the best decision for what I get the information from. Today's problem is there's too much information out there. Okay, you can't separate the truth from the faults out here today. I like being middle of the road. I'm like Eisenhower, be middle of the road. It pisses everybody off on both sides. They don't like it. The guys, Martin Van Buren does nothing to help the American people. It gets worse. Here comes the Whig Party with, Ms. with Mr. Harrison, William Harry Harrison, and John Tyler. The slogan for the campaign was Tippecanoe and Tyler too. Tippecanoe was a big Indian battle in which he destroyed the big, huge settlement that the Thompson was going to build up here for his pan Indian nation. Tippecanoe and Tyler too. On March the 4th, 1841, Washington, D.C., it is freezing cold. The wind is blowing out of the Northwest. It is cold up here. Probably the chill effect is probably about around five degrees. It was cold up here. Mr. Harrison walked down to the inaugural platform in front of the Capitol building, but left his hat and his overcoat at the White House. All he had on was his suit coat. He talked for an hour and 30 minutes. He the longest inaugural speech in American history. And during this speech, he got chilled. He goes into the White House. He tries to get warmed up. By the middle of the night, he's coughing. The next couple of days, he's got a real bad deep cough, and it turns into bronchitis. Within a couple of weeks, he's got full-fledged pneumonia. And on April the 4th, one month at the inauguration, on April the 4th, William Henry Harrison dies. He's the first president who died in office. The Constitution says that the vice president should become the new president. A lot of people did not trust John Tyler. They didn't want him in there. A lot of people called for a new election. And John Tyler stood firm on the Constitution and says, no, the Constitution is very clear on this. When a president dies, the vice president takes the oath of office. And John Tyler becomes your new president. He'll throw out the four years that were, they were extra guaranteed for Mr. Harrison. John Tyler returns to his old democratic ways. He looks like Andrew Jackson all over again. So Jackson really did serve for 12 years, if you want the truth about it. He served the four years of Mr. Van Buren and the four years of Mr. John Tyler. These were all Jacksonians here in this time period. They followed the rules of Jacksonian. And the man behind him served for four years, and that's going to be James K. Polk, and he's also a Jacksonian. We have 16 years here, guys, in which a Jacksonian person was in charge of the government. And you wonder how come we went to war in 1861. John Tyler is known for three things. 
three things John Tyler did as president. Number one, he had more children in the White House than any other president. John Tyler and his wife had 14 children, 14 kids in the White House. Okay, they allowed ponies and goats and sheep and dogs and all kinds of animals in and out of the White House. It's a real circus up here in the White House during John Tyler's administration. Number two, we started expanding the Navy during this time period. We're going to get close to about 60 wooden ships, sailing ships during this time period. We also are going to start opening up trade relations with China. That's your second thing. We're going to put a relationship with China. We start trading with China. If you're an East Coast shipper, and we have no West Coast during this time period, if you're an East Coast shipper out of Boston or New York or Philadelphia or Savannah or Charleston, in order to go to China, you got to sail down the Atlantic Ocean to the tip of South America, come around that stormy sea down there where a lot of ships wreck, make your way to the Galapagos Islands, and come on up toward Hawaii. And from Hawaii, you head out toward Hong Kong or Tokyo or one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, West Coast cities of, of uh, or the East Coast cities of China. The trip to China is going to take you about six months. To go from Boston to San Francisco is going to take about 120 days to get there. It'll be a long trip. Well, they realized the American sailors need a place to rest on the voyage to China. And so John Tyler is going to make an agreement with the royalty of Hawaii. And through the agreement here, the American merchant fleet is allowed to have a stayover at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Pearl Harbor, Hawaii becomes a major area here for R&R &R for our merchant marines, our merchant fleets. Concerned about protection around Hawaii, we get permission to allow the Navy to go to Hawaii. We sent, we sent about 16 ships out of Hawaii to Hawaii to kind of take care of our trade route out here across the Pacific. So now the military is in Hawaii, along with our, along with our merchant fleet who stays over on R&R. &R, we start free trade with China during this time period. And that free trade with China will last until 1949 when China goes communist, okay? So guys, when I discuss Andrew Jackson and what it takes us in this time period, I think you can see what kind of issues we have to deal with and how Andrew Jackson was a major catalyst for the Civil War. And you can see Andrew Jackson and a lot of the presidents after him, a lot of the ones who are very controlling, want to do things their way. You see a lot of Andrew Jackson, okay? When I come back the next time, we're going to discuss the culture of the time period and how the American people are living. Okay? All right, guys, this takes care of section two of the class. And behind this lecture will come an exam. So y'all need to watch lectures number four, five, six, seven, and eight for your second exam. Okay? All right, folks, I will see y'all later.